Would you like to learn more about your ancestors during the Civil War era? Today, we are going to learn about the resources found in what is commonly called the Freedmen Bureau Records. Keep in mind that while the Freedmen Bureau Records are great for African American research, there are a few whites listed in there as well. Officially called the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, this bureau was established in 1865 to aid in the reconstruction of the South following the Civil War. This bureau was to assist formerly enslaved persons to transition to a lifestyle of freedom. Along the way, the bureau maintained records of individuals it assisted, and many of those records are available and valuable to your family research. Hey, if this is your first time here, my name is Connie Knox. I am a lifelong genealogist here to help you go further, faster, but factually with your family research. Now today, we are fortunate enough to have Diane L. Richard, a professional genealogist, author, lecturer, and editor of the North Carolina Genealogical Journal. Now she also runs her own business called Mosaic Research and Project Management out of Raleigh, North Carolina. She's a busy woman, so we were fortunate the other day to wrangle some time with her to talk about the Freedmen Bureau records and a little bit about the Freedmen Bank records as well. We're going to get all of that going here in just a moment, but I wanted to remind you to subscribe and ring the bell so that you get notified each time we upload a video. Also know that I've added links in the show notes below of the items that we talk about in this interview. So sit back and relax and hear all about the Freedmen Bureau records and what they can do to help you with your family research. And now, on to that interview with Diane L. Richard, right now. Well, welcome to the show. I appreciate you coming and talking about the Freedmen Bureau records. Uh, help us to understand what these records are and uh, well, let's just start right there. All right, um, these are some of the most important immediate post-Civil War records that exist for research. Um, they're, the majority of them cover about 1865 to 1868, so it's immediately after the Civil War, and before that 1870 census when most people kind of find their families or catch up to them, hopefully at that point. Um, they're really important because it's basically a huge wealth program that was put in place uh, for short-term relief. The Civil War came through, it impacted states quite differently. Um, the Freedmen's Bureau actually had offices from Delaware to Texas. As one can imagine, um, across that geography, your needs were not all the same. And it was really your southern states. A uh, state like North Carolina was not terribly rich before the Civil War. Once the Civil War came through, it was incredibly poor um, across the state. And that's true for other deep southern states that what, what the war really took it out of them. Um, so, you know, your North Carolina, your Georgia, your Alabama, your Mississippi. Um, South Carolina. Yeah, your, you know, your Carolinas. It, it's not, I mean, yes, Virginia, Virginia was impacted, but it's a bit more of a mid-Atlantic state than a kind of true southern state. And it had a really strong economy beforehand. That's why even South Carolina wasn't as affected as North Carolina, because Charleston was a big hub also. Okay. But it's as you kind of, if you think of going southwest out of North Carolina toward Texas, it's that belt because that's where, where actually your plantation owners, their extended families and slaves were being moved as okay. it was for the economy at that time. And then that economy disappeared um, in that regard. Um, so what you had in, in North Carolina, think how many Confederate soldiers didn't come home. Hmm. Think how many widows with small children were left how many farms were destroyed and or did not have help to work on them. Think how many parents lost their sons um, to help manage their farms. So that kind of gives you a, a sense. And then you have this influx of all of a sudden, all of um, the freedmen or those who had previously been enslaved now looking to get off the plantations and you know, start their lives as freed individuals around the state but you know if you don't have crops on the ground and cattle there what are you going to do type thing so the government literally stepped in and it's called the bureau of refugees freedmen and abandoned lands but we always call it the freedmen's bureau um, to shorten it and it provided a lot of services in that critical um, short time period to try to help the citizens get back on their feet after the destruction wrought by the war both uh, to the landscape, but also to the economies at that time, and also uh, put 
uh, resources out there so that those that had previously been enslaved could now also become more in control of their own destiny going forward in the sense of education, uh, contracts with remuneration, um, legal system that was looking out for them, temporary housing, uh, just all the healthcare, you know, access to hospitals, um, things along that line. So that's a huge component when I talk about the Freedmen Bureau or consider it. And there is one other element that I know we'll talk about, which is abandoned lands, which is really very different um, element. That was really helping those who left the South or abandoned their land reclaim it after the war. So there's a lot of different record sets within the Freedmen Bureau records, is that right? Yes, um, the Freedmen's Bureau records have a lot of different kinds of records. Now part of it, because the Freedmen's Bureau came out of the War Department, you have to think big government administration. So one component is what I call correspondence, letters in, letters out. The guy running the department locally saying, I got your circular. Did you get my circular? I am going on a trip today. I am back from my, you know, it's not germane to us as genealogists. It's really the administration of it. Once we get outside of those letters, and there can be some letters of, of value um, that are personal, you have a lot of records, many of which show up under miscellaneous category in these records. But they end up being things dealing with food, housing, schooling, medical care, U.S. colored troops, um, contra letting contracts, I might have repeated myself there, um, the abandoned hands getting back. I want to think that uh, I, marriage records? There were marriage records in that group, wasn't there? Yes, uh, marriage records, thank you. Um, marriage records is another uh, category. I have a tendency to forget about those because in North Carolina, the Freedmen's Bureau did not do marriage records. Um, it's true for a couple of different states besides North Carolina, because North Carolina had their own system of cohabitation bonds for documentation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For all those other, yeah, so it's you look for cohabitation bonds. It was handled by the state. They're a separate collection. They're not part of the Freedmen's Bureau. And for those other southern states, though, marriage records are pretty much think of 1865, 1866 time period, you will find marriage records um, that are documented in the Freedmen's Bureau at that time. Now, there's a couple of things I like to mention about the marriage records is that both parties have to be alive. Everybody anticipating that this is my first chance, I can find out about my enslaved ancestors, I can find out blank. Well, if one or the other of the parent, person's parents is deceased, there's not gonna be a cohabitation record. They have to be alive. Two, it's not gonna mention anything except typically their name and possibly how long they've been married and maybe an age, maybe. Um, often the women's name is the same surname as the husband's name because if they were on the same plantation, they may not have ever really had distinct surnames or not have taken on a different right. surname. And what people forget, too, is you didn't have to register a cohabitation. You know, nobody was marching you down to the courthouse and saying, okay, you have to go in the courthouse, you have to register. Now, many wanted to register those unions. You know, they wanted the acknowledgement of those unions that they had and that they were carrying forth into their life as freed, ind uh, you know, freed individuals, but they weren't required to do it. So there's a lot of marriages that are not documented with you cohabitation bonds or the marriage records of the Freedmen's Bureau, and that's just something for people to be aware of. Well, we're going to take a break uh, right now, and when we come back, we're going to talk about a little bit more about some of the other record sets that are within the Freedmen Bureau right when we come back. Hey, I hope you're enjoying watching Genealogy TV. I just wanted to give you a quick tour of the website so that you could find things quickly. Two areas that I find I go to the most when looking at a YouTube channel are videos and playlists. Clicking through to videos gives you a list of all the videos I've uploaded. Clicking on playlists 
groups those videos into categories that you might find interesting. For example, if you're interested in the DNA series or you're interested in photo restoration, all of those videos that I have created are grouped together for your convenience. Just remember that when you are looking at a video to scroll down and click on the show more area. Showing more gives you those links that we talk about throughout the videos and those are there for your convenience and helps you get to those record sets quickly. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you'd like to support Genealogy TV, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash genealogy TV. All right, we're back and we are going to talk about some more records and uh, top of your list, Diane, uh, was which set of records within the Friedman Bureau? It's it's, it's the rations records. Um, those are where names are going to be found. As genealogists, we were always looking for documents that name names. What people often um, wrongly assume are that the Freedmen's records are just records about those who were enslaved and became free um, with the end of the Civil War. They are clearly in those records. They're clearly a huge part of those records. But if you remember that poverty we discussed earlier, what that means is that in, in a case like North Carolina, there is a lot of impoverished individuals. So when you look at ration records for North Carolina, I would say approximately 50% or more are actually gonna be documented um, the families of Confederate soldiers, the families um, who didn't have sons that went to war. It's going to be, in essence, to be politically not correct nowadays, but what we'd call the white population. Um, that's who's going to be documented. So these records are important to everybody who's researching their ancestors right after that Civil War ends, because there's a very good chance they're receiving rations because those crops had been destroyed, their farms had been mutilated. And so ration records, um, they're issued in just about every office in the state like North Carolina. Ration records are a very short-term relief. Uh, people basically got pork and corn. So they got so many pounds of it based on how many individuals were in their family. Um, the ledgers often will not name who's in the family. They'll identify that it's three adults and two children, Okay. Uh, things along um, that line. A lot of households were headed at the head were women or groups of women, because what you would get are sisters-in-law or sisters who would actually band together when their husbands were all killed um, and come together and pool their resources into one household. Um, et cetera. And basically, the, to get rations, you had to be poor, destitute, feeble, um, disabled, et cetera. So when you look at ration lists, um, they are the most color-free records in the sense in this collection, mm -hmm. because you can look at each list, and even if they're identified as white or colored, it's all the exact same circumstance driving everybody to come and request um, ration records. Um, so this is the pla number one place you want to look in these records to find a possible ancestor listed. All right, good to know. So in the, in the ration records, uh, do, so they don't really specify any relationships between people. It's just listing, it's kind of almost like a census listing how many people are there. Yeah. And that, that's exactly the way I think it's an enumeration that took place in that community. It's typically going to be a white list and a colored or black list um, that exists in a community. Um, now, sometimes you will find some pleasant surprises in um, some of them. Um, there's a list that comes out of Raleigh that actually what it does is it lists um, the previous slave owners, which that's invaluable the only ration list I have directly come across so far because you can imagine I kept looking after right. that uh, you find a gem you want to find more of them but I only was looking mostly across North Carolina so something similar could exist in other states um, but there's a ration list I came across and it literally listed the individual's names and who their former plantation owner is well that's invaluable on two levels one you're getting the information on their plantation owner the other part is a few of those individuals did not have the same surname as that plantation owner. So for example, in North Carolina, you, many um, of those previously enslaved 
will assume a name that they did have a connection to that either they lived on as a plantation or their parents lived on or they were born on if it was a different plantation. Um, there's not as much um, in North Carolina of people changing their names. Though in other states, you'll find surnames are often not linked to a plantation. You know, it, it's just, it just varies greatly. So this one list I found showed that even from the same plantation, one person had a different surname than the other individuals, yet they were all from the same plantation. Well, that just, you know, that gives you a new place to start where you wouldn't have, uh, you would have struggled to find that information in any other document. So tell me about the, uh, I, I see in your, in your slides here that you've got uh, established schools. Yes, one of, um, education was not really a factor um, during the years of enslavement. And it was, in fact, we could say, go so far as to say it was actively discouraged. No, um, they did yeah. not want slaves to be empowered. So education was not occurring except uh, the down low, you know, if somebody um, could sneak it happening at a certain yeah. level. So schools were one of the first things that were established um, after the Civil War. And a neat thing about the school records that I have found is we often think of school age children as being what, five to 18, you know, in the sense of kindergarten through high school. Mm -hmm. um, back at this time, so infants were considered to be five to 20. So sometimes you'll consider not necessarily that they were at school, but up to 21 was still considered underage. You know, or nowadays 18, you have certain rights you get, then 21, et cetera. What I found in these school lists is you'll find adults that are 28, 29 years old attending school. So schools weren't limited to just the children who came out of being enslaved. But if there were adults interested in attending school and getting an education, they could do that also. And so schoolhouses were set up um, across the states. Um, and there are additional records. Um, the records we're mostly talking about are the local created, but there was also a whole hierarchy, an administrative hierarchy that focused on um, schools and education. So those who attended the schools are they in those records? The, are the names? Yes. Um, in the local records, when we're looking at them, um, I can't say they serve for every county through time or every school. You will find school lists, and it will list out the names of those who are attending the school. Um, it will often include their age. Um, so you can use that information to correlate to the 1870 census. Um, at when they are freed, but you can also use that to possibly link them to earlier records because you do have an, a first name and an age. And then a surname, which could again be um, the name they had um, from when they were on a plantation or farm. Okay. Uh, hospitals, let's talk about the hospitals. Hospitals, healthcare, um, you know, up until this point, the Civil War and its needs. Um, create a necessity for hospitals, obviously with all the soldiers and what was occurring. Well, as a result of those hospitals coming about, it also provided uh, locations where freedmen could get services also. Now, this is not a case where hospitals were built in every community. You're not gonna find it in your small communities. It's still gonna be your local doctor who you hope will provide services to you just as occurred uh, before, except now one-to-one -one instead of um, him visiting um, the farm or the plantation. Um, but you did have hospitals um, that could, you know, people could get treatment. That's going to be a bit more in your urban areas than in your rural areas. <laughs> uh, are there anything for genealogists in the hospital records? Yes, you can find names of patients listed. Um, and actually, sometimes what you find are lists of soldiers now people would expect soldiers medical records would be part of the civil war compiled service records collection mm -hmm. um, what i have discovered is that some of these hospital records that survive are listing some of the occupation troops that came into the state to help um, you know ensure safety across the state um, so i was tracking a hospital and it took me it was i kept going where are these soldiers from I know a unit they served in. I know exactly all this alphabet soup of their service. I eventually found out it was a New York regiment. 
that oh, was wow. serving. And so they were in the hospital and it listed out why they were in the hospital. Um, as with all medical records though, be careful if, you have a, if you're squeamish, because uh, they'll tell you exactly what those individuals were being treated for and uh, many moms and wives and girlfriends would not necessarily want to know. And all the gory detail, huh? Yeah, gory detail and you know some diseases we don't associate <laughs> with uh, plate company, shall we say. Okay. <laughs> uh, I see on your list here, apprenticed children and labor contracts. Yes, um, before, even before the Civil War ends, you have um, a large population of white children, but even more free persons of color children who are being apprenticed. And typically apprenticing came about because the community did not want to support that, that child. Um, so a way not to support them directly was to have somebody take them on as an apprentice. There would be an agreement um, for that apprentice which would incorporate education, what they have, how they have to be educated, what trade they're gonna learn, clothing, food, um, possibly education, etc. Well, the Civil War comes through, will you still have children being orphaned? Um, so now what happens is you have a large, um, a new larger um, group of people who had previously been enslaved, but they're children. Um, so unless they have family that take them on and or um, who they were living with are able to get employment, they're liable to be apprenticed again. So apprentice records, and it's actually a mix of records. Color is not indicated in many of the apprentice records I looked at. We'd have to look at other records to determine who are we looking at Interesting. Um, in terms of race. Because again, you still had um, you know, white children who th their fathers uh, were killed in the army and then their mothers died of, in childbirth or something. Grandparents can't take them on. You don't have extended family. Um, those who had previously been free persons of color are obviously still free persons, but now they're just part of the more general mix of individuals out there. Same things occurring. And you have those children that had been, an orf had been orphaned while enslaved who are now also um, seeking to be placed in the community. And those again are naming names. They have a tendency with the children to not necessarily give them a surname, which is really, really frustrating as a genealogist. But what I have noticed is often family groups will be together. So you'll get three or four children listed in a row, oldest to youngest with their names. Well, then you can look at the 1870 census, hopefully, and use that census to put a surname to them. Nice. A surname that's different than, you know, who is um, uh, apprenticing them. Good tip. You have labor contracts here. Tell me yes, about Yes, um, labor contracts, you know, um, it's, they're, that's the new world at that time, right? But now, instead of having enslaved labor who you purchased and they have to do whatever you tell them to do, there now has to be a quid pro quo uh, arrangement. And so you now have contracts and part of the, what the Freedmen's Bureau was doing was trying to ensure that those contracts had some equity in them. Um, and also that they were enforced, you know, that people just didn't write a contract to kind of go back to the old ways and figure, well, what are you going to do about it type thing. Um, right. So you have contracts, they're really one page contracts at most, that's the largest I've seen. Um, they will list um, who's signing it, um, what their obligations are in terms of their work hours, what jobs they have to do, um, is clothing provided and what kind, is housing provided? Because um, typically what they were gonna receive in their contract was not hard cash. What you were gonna receive was a percentage of maybe extra uh, grain that was produced. Or if an extra bunch of piglets came along, you might have kind of a sharing opportunity, but there wasn't always a lot of hard currency um, that was involved. And the nice thing with these contracts is you'd actually get notices put in the newspaper by the Freedmen's Bureau saying, we know you all have contracts with people. Winter is coming. Don't think to not pay them or, you know, give them what they're owed. 
and abandon them because they'll come after. And it's unfortunate they had to do that, but that was the nature of the times that people, and people, if you look through the court records, there are court records also, you'll see a lot of instances where there were plantation owners who basically would sign up with some people, not pay them or do anything, then bring on other people to do the same work and basically um, try to screw individuals out of what they deserve for the effort that they put in and try to keep them subservient. Wow. That's sad. It's, it's sad. And, but be prepared that for all of those one page contracts that I mentioned, a lot of times we just have a list and just know that there were contracts between um, a particular farmer and somebody or a group of somebody's or a particularly particular factory owner and he had contracts with other individuals we might not get any of the details except knowing who when and where and then we'll have to use other records to see if maybe those businesses or farms left records that might tell us a bit more you mentioned that there were some soldiers in the hospitals. Um, were there any other military records uh, within the bureaus? Yes, interestingly enough, again, there's other military records and people don't think to look in the Freedmen's Bureau. You have something called U.S. Color Troops Confidential is another set of records. Um, and what this was is, you know, back in the day, everybody didn't have those photo IDs. They didn't have those social security numbers. <laughs> they didn't, you didn't have any of that. You know, we take for granted nowadays, you'd show a photo, right? To say here, this is who I am. Here's my name. Here's what I have my social security number. You can track me through, I don't even know how many places. So you have records that were created so that soldiers returning could get payments um, or their family could get payments. Um, and what okay. gets interesting is that you will get a, a physical description of an individual if there's any also unique attributes like a scar or they're missing an arm or, you know, so basically something to create a, a visual image to the to, to somebody so they could think, yes, this is you. I'm going to give you this last payment because that your name matches, your description matches, you're the soldier that was described to me. As a part of that, you'll also find payments were made to families for those soldiers who did not return home from the U.S. Colored Troops. And those payments will list explicit family memberships. They are some of the gems in this collection because they do mention families. So what you'll find is the soldier will be listed and then next to that might be um, sister, mother, wife, father. And what I have seen is you'll find siblings mentioned and they all have different surnames. Remember we talked about that issue of how do you know what surname right. somebody took? Did they take the same surname? Is the surname um, attributable? Sometimes a woman marrying, who did she marry? Maybe we don't have a cohabitation record. Right. So you can literally create this little family tree of possibly mother, three kids and the soldier and all with names, all in a particular place. And I mean, that's just priceless when you're doing research to, to get handed explicit relationships like that. Good tip. That's a good, good one. Um, you know, the questions keep popping into my head. Uh, <laughs> I, to I told you these records are dangerous. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so you also have a slide here about the hired, hired by Freedmen's Bureau uh constructing some barracks and stuff here yes um again what happens is the farmers or plantation owners one either the farms might have been destroyed so there may be no buildings left or if there's buildings left and you're not working for that farmer are they going to necessarily let you squat on the land it, mm -hmm. it varied we'll just leave it at that so some did and many didn't so literally barracks were built, temporary housing to put people in. Um, it's kind of like a US government today. Um, I guess surplus, I think is the word we use that you have it. So I was able to determine that there are entries where you have uh, people contract hired. They're hired to build these temporary facilities that are needed. Sometimes it could be non-temporary, but I'm thinking more temporary. They get used for a year or so, and then I'd find a newspaper notice listing them for clearance um, in the newspaper to say, we're selling off this facility. 
The nice thing is, again, you have names listed. Now you're gonna have to do your homework with them because they're gonna just list that you have a whole bunch of um, contractors or con you know they're doing construction. So what I would do is I then use that 1870 census again and pull out the names and start looking and go, who are you? And from that, as I expected, for the most part, those leading the construction crew were more likely to be representatives of the Freedmen's Bureau, mm -hmm. but most of the individuals actually working had a tendency to be those um, previously enslaved who are now freed, and the, and the 1870 census corroborated that for the ones that I um, pursued. So it sounds like you need to use these records in conjunction with other records to help put the whole story together. You, you really do. Um, ration lists will have a tendency to indicate color. Court records have a tendency to indicate color. U.S. colored troops by their nature are reflecting um, color. But all of the rest of them, um, it, it really varies. Um, sometimes in correspondence, you'll see reference, you'll see C-O-L next to a name or the word colored. Mm -hmm. um, next to a name. But for many of these records, um, you really don't know until you look at something else. Even those school records are at that point were supposed to be for freed um, slaves. I haven't corroborated all of that. I don't know if there were other poor individuals because you did have another school system going on at the time. But I can definitely say when you look at all those other records, um, you need you're required to look at another set of records so because you don't want to confuse your John Smith with another exactly. John Smith in the area. I mean, it's the same problem you have. But in this case, it would also be not just a name problem, but a, a color or heritage problem. Exactly. Right person, right place, right time. You and know. with a name that's convenient, but that doesn't mean, you know, slaves are often named for family, you, you know, yeah. you know, and names are often repeated across extended family. So it's, you're just compounding the issue of making sure you're looking at the right person or attributing the right data to the right person. Now you mumbled something earlier about land records, which we didn't actually pull a slide for, but. Um... Yes, abandoned um, lands. It's part of the title of it. Um, as genealogists, of course, I got more caught up in more the humor, <laughs> human suffering and trying to get people on their feet type Mm -hmm. records um, because that's where it started. In fact, it wasn't until I looked at some ration records and realized who all was represented in there that it really opened my eyes to the diversity of these records. And one of the few categories where you're actually guaranteed to find more records for the white individuals of the time and not enslave, uh, the previously enslaved individuals are those trying to reclaim their land, the abandoned lands. Because in most cases, those who are abandoning their lands were probably white property owners at the time, and they are now trying to come back into the community. Now, in a state like North Carolina and other states where you also had large free persons of color populations, you may also find in like a New Bern that it was also free persons of color abandoning their lands. But did you want somebody to ask you the, not ask you the question, are you a runaway slave or are you a free person, you know, if you're thinking of your personal security, I can imagine individuals relocating and then hoping to come, to come back. And um, what, what happens is these land records are interesting because one, an oath had to be declared. That was one component. You basically had to say, I'm gonna follow the new government and the new government rules and I am going to treat everybody equitably, et cetera. And you had to sign an oath to that effect. So that's one component of it, which was required. The other component is that you had to offer proof of ownership for that piece of land you're trying to reclaim. Right. And another component actually related to that is you often have details that are provided that are hard for us to track because land doesn't always have to be deeded between individuals. It can be inherited. If it's inherited, you don't have the same kind of paper trail. You may not have a paper trail for 200 years on a lot in New Bern because the same family kept, kept owning it. They inherited it. There's no um, um, deed for it. 
deeds don't have to be registered. So even if you did purchase it from somebody you don't know, a stranger, that lot in New Bern, you may not have a deed because you guys never registered it because you did a handshake and an exchange of money. So what happens is, one, you're getting very specific information about an address, which your 1870 and 1880 census don't give addresses. They don't give lot numbers. They, you just know what county and what's the nearest post office type thing. You're getting exact lot numbers and sometimes cross streets. That was going to be my next question was how much of a land description was there? Sometimes it will be a lot number from what might be the original plot. The other will be a cross street, two cross streets. Okay. And if people didn't have their own deed or a will to show, they would get affidavits from the others living in the, the neighborhood. Okay, I know that Joe Schmo, he's been my business neighbor for the last 20 years. I know that that's his place. So it, it also gives you a sense of who else, part of the fan club, the friends, associates, and neighbors component of our research. It gives you some neat insight into that. So in fact, I actually thought it was more fun when I had to say I didn't find deeds listed, but I found neighbors giving affidavits because I wanted to know who are those people? Who's giving an affidavit to substantiate this person's claim that that's their land. So really a lot of fascinating information can come out. So I know that these records are the latter half of the 1860s. And um, I had just last week did an interview about the Southern Claims Commission, which was the 1870s that refer often back to that same time period. Did these, do these records intermingle at all with the Southern Claims Commission, or are these completely separate? They're completely separate. It was a completely separate entity, um, completely separate purpose. Now, it doesn't mean you won't find people named in both. Um, for example, you might find a, plant, a farm owner, and I say plantation just meaning a bigger farm, but North Carolina, very few of them were huge we're not talking hundreds and hundreds of, of the people enslaved, we're often talking less than 10 um, in many uh, cases. They might be on a contract, you know, so they, they do a contract with those previously working on their plantation, they now have a contract. They might then go to the Southern Claims Commission though and go, my slave Joe helped build your road for you, I wanna get the money back for that slave Joe now. Or, Somebody took three of my horses, I want to get, you know, remuneration for that. Um, now, the thing with the Southern Claims uh, Commission is you're always going to get more union side payments That's true. reimbursed. Good point. You're yeah. not going to get as many Confederate, but people applied. So the value isn't whether they got their claim, whether it was allowed or rejected, as we say, it's that they made a claim and actually, so, and, and those enslaved are mentioned in those claims. So we do want to look at them, but like you said, they're slightly different time period and their focus is different, but I, you will find people that are listed in both sets of records because they're covering a fairly tight period of time and it's going to be the, a lot of the same people involved. Well, I love this as another option to, to bridge the gap between census records. You know, I'm always trying to point that out. You know, uh, so in this case, between 1860 and 1870 for the uh, Freedmen's Bureau records. Definitely. And that's um, actually, when I'm giving this talk, I say that's true for everybody. You know, it's not just for those who are enslaved, it's for everybody. Because the end of the Civil War really changed the economy of states. Um, and by it was a mess, and though mo more people probably moved after 1870 to link up to other people to, for economic opportunities, et cetera, you already had, as the Civil War ended, people in motion and moving. And so to have these little fine-tuned records, um, like you said, I, I think anybody who has a family, I always tell people, especially in North Carolina, there's a lot of records. If you had a family, and I don't care if you thought they were poor, rich, or whatever, it doesn't matter. I would look at these records because, especially if you can't find them in 1870. This might now, did all these them, records but, survive? Um, you know, like with any record group, you had a lot of sub-offices passing information up to a, 
a higher level, a regional or state level office. You had offices coming and going. Um, we have no way to know that all the records survive. Based on what I know um, needed to have occurred in each of these locations, I will guarantee you what, what I'm looking at is not all those records um, because it's just not possible. I mean, some groups you have good coverage, but if you look at the um, finding aids for these records, it's very clear that some offices have more records than others, and yet they're providing similar services. Or you'll find real haphazard things that, gosh, I see no rations here, but I see school lists. Well, what's the chance that you hit a school and you weren't doing rations and say, you know, a certain county. Um, so you have to kind of recognize that what I tell people is interpret what you find and see. You know, so when you find a record, that's good. Go with it. But don't read into not finding a record because it might be a case where there was a record created and it doesn't survive. But there also might just not have been a record created. So be very, very careful about <laughs> you know, trying to fill those gaps um, or fill them by looking elsewhere for other records if possible. Now, there was a Freedman's Bank, right? Yes, um, there was a Freedman's Bank. It was one of several other institutions that um, started about the same time. Um, they often get confused because the Freedmen's Bank and the Freedmen's Bureau sound the same. They're actually spelled a little differently. One is Freedmen, M-E-N. The other is Freedman, M-A-N. Okay. Um, the bank is the man. <laughs> the Bureau is the men. And um, it was a completely separate entity, but obviously it's serving the same period of time. It's serving the same population. It actually didn't exist very long because of... Um, poor accounting and practices into the 18th century. It actually did eventually disappear. Mm -hmm. But what it is, is it was an opportunity for those who are um, now not enslaved to have some place where as they did work and did start earning some money, or if they received money in some fashion, um, they could have a place to deposit it. And the thing is, is there's not nearly as many Freedmen's Banks as there are bureaus. So for example, in North Carolina, you only had three banks. They only had uh, Raleigh, Wilmington, I think, and New Bern, I think, were the three. That's okay. not very many. It's, so it's very particular locations. Equal records, again, don't survive. So if you can find a Freedman's Bank record for somebody, it might list their parents, their kids, who's dead, who's alive, where they live, who they were sold to sometimes. I mean, it can be a very detailed history. Or it can be a one-line item, the bank that says this person had a deposit, that's all we know. Um, so wow. again, the records vary in great detail um, depending on um, the banks. It's also, again, it was not limited to those who had formerly been enslaved to make deposits at the bank. So again, it's another record group. You're going to want to use other records to corroborate, um, to make sure you're pursuing. Um, now, obviously, if somebody makes a statement about being enslaved, then you can have some confidence uh, uh, along those lines. But if no indication is given about that, you know, if you just know a birthplace and these other facts, you're going to want to look at other records to, because um, immigrants could use this bank. Um, basically, any, anybody could use this bank. There's many examples of people new to the country, people who've lived here a long time. Because again, it was a banking institution that existed and nobody, I, I'm not aware of restrictions on who could deposit with it. Okay, so going back to the Freedmen's uh, Bureau records for a moment, um, could it be that you would find the same individual in several different parts of these records? Because obviously there's kind of subsets within this. this oh, definitely. I mean, if you think about it, you could find um, a mother receiving rations. Her children mm -hmm. are then at school. Her, the whole family could be on a contract. So it's just the men who signed the con. Um, right. Somebody could be in a hospital. Um, somebody could have been a U.S. Colored Troop soldier. So it's definitely a, a group of records. Um, you don't want to stop with a find and figure that's the only record you might find for that person. It might be, um, and we haven't even mentioned correspondence, which you and I could talk about that for a long, long time. But there's a whole other category of that correspondence we talked about in the beginning. Some of those are very personal letters. 
So those people can be on a ration list getting rations, and at the same time, they're writing a letter to find their grandchild who's still being effectively enslaved. Oh, um, so those those correspondents may have been, they were, what, writing to the Bureau? To yes, they would write to the Bureau and say, um, Joe Schmo is, has my grandson, and he has not let that child be free. Is there something you can do about it? Or my, I know that my um, husband was sold off into another state. Is there anything you can do to help me find that individual? This is who owned them at that time, the last I heard. Um, it could be things like I have a contract with somebody and they are not paying me. They have now brought in four other people instead of the four people who did all the work mm -hmm. and the four people brought in, you know. So yeah. anything where there was, they're seeking some form of redress or information, that's what correspondence could provide an opportunity for. And correspondence would then go into the system and have to go up the system in a way and then it comes back. Well, what can be frustrating with correspondence? These offices often only were open for a few weeks or a couple of months and they would shut. And then next year, a poor harvest and a new office opens. Well, where does the answer come back? Is an answer made? So I have found a lot of correspondence where I find one side, but I can't find the answer. The nice thing though with a government entity and correspondence is you have a local copy. They send it up the chain hey, there might be a copy now at the state level. Oh, it's going, it's a question about this. It might end up someplace else. So you might be able to find, you don't have to worry about finding the one copy because there could be four or five of them within the paperwork. So don't worry if you don't find the local one and you feel confident because you might find that it, as you go through it, but you have to go through it. Correspondence, I mean, there's a lot of access now that we have. Um, the Discover Freedmen's Project um, before the newest Smithsonian Museum uh, went live, oh, yeah, yeah. I guess like what two years ago now I'm thinking, they indexed them. The thing to know is it's a simple indexing, um, locations aren't always tagged in court. It's like any project, it has its limitations. The nice thing though is it is giving us some insight into that correspondence. So I had manually looked and found a letter. I did not know what had occurred, but by searching, I found the other three versions of it. Still never found an answer, but I did find, you know, um, duplication of some of it. And in other cases, I found one letter. It was at the local level, it never went someplace. Um, but again, if you don't look, you're not gonna know. That's what I tell people. It takes you but a few minutes to do a superficial look in these records and see if a name pops. So if somebody's gonna look for these records, where do they go? I mean, where is the best place to start? Basically, um, I just Google search on Discover Friedman. It literally, the one word together, it's actually overlaid on a family search collection. Okay. Um, Ancestry has its own collection, but Ancestry is a subscription service. Ancestry has been working to index more of theirs. Historically, theirs were not indexed, um, so it's awkward to use. But as a first thing, I always say, go to Discover Friedman. You're going to put a search in. You're going to be brought to the Family Search site. Okay. And then you can add terms to fine tune it. So I'll get a lot of hits on a name, and then I'll go. Well, I just want North Carolina, so I'll put in North Carolina, and then all of a sudden that will reduce it down. Mm -hmm. um, and again, and then when you do that, you can then um, find out what those entries are and then physically look at a digitized image. And then you might then you might determine, oh, that could be my ancestor. That actually is in the right place and time. Or no, that it's not, it's the wrong colored person, you know, because there's a color designation, or the location is just completely in the wrong area. Okay. All right. Well, I'll try and put some of that information in the show notes as far as links to how to get to that stuff. Um, have I missed anything? But I think the only, one thing I would add um, is that there are finding aids that were created for the original microfilm that these digital um, versions are based on. Okay. And on the NARA website, you can, uh, there's a unique finding aid for each state for the Freedmen's Bureau. 
Oh, by state. state. That's good. By state. It's by state. And what's that like? And so that's very nice because, again, the states varied in terms of when they had the services. They varied in terms of how many district locations they had, uh, the local locate, the field offices, as they call them. Field offices came and went. Districts came and went. There's a lot of movement in that. But if you look at the finding aid before you dig in, you can get a fairly accurate sense of, do I have a chance of finding something? You know, I'll look at some field offices and go, you have all correspondence, but there's no ration list, no school list, no whatever. Well, I have to think about, okay, what could I learn from that collection? Do I want to dive in? Or I'm probably not going to find somebody. So it kind of mentally prepares you. For another location, I might look and go, you've got everything. You've got court records, you've got ration lists, you've got contracts, you've got out, outrages, you, you've got everything. Awesome. I have a good chance I could find a family member. So it allows you to have um, realistic expectations of you know, what you may or may not find. Um, and I know it's old school to look at a finding aid like that, but otherwise you're searching in a database and you don't know what's not there. The question we talked about before, right? You know, you, if you might be looking for something that does not exist in the location you're seeking. Sometimes those finding aids, uh, taking five minutes to read a finding aid can save you hours of digging. It can save you. Realize, oh, wait a minute. This is not even the time frame, or this is not even the yes. place that I'm looking at. So right. Yeah. Or, okay, I don't find them listed. They must have not got rations. Well, no, there was no ration list for that period of time, or there was no marriage record, or there was no school list. That's why you're not seeing them. Well, this has been um, very helpful. Uh, thank you for, for giving us all this information. Uh, where can people find you? I know you have a website. I have a website, yes. I say, you're so, you're so good with this. Yes, I have a website. Um, basically, my business is called Mosaic Research and Project Management. So my website is www.mosaicrpm.com. And then on my website, I have information about um, talks I have given, will give, articles I've written, um, research services I provide, and there is a contact me um, component there, so um, you can do that. You can also find me on Facebook. Again, I would say just look for my, it's on, I have a business one and a personal one, so look for me and or my business and you'll find me. Well, I know you lecture a lot. You write a ton of articles. I was uh, digging through your your list of stuff. Like <laughs> yeah. It keeps and, me on the Oh trouble. my gosh, you've written so much. <laughs> and um, and so you're constantly lecturing, and that's how we first met, because uh, I saw you give this speech. So hopefully uh, if somebody, and there's, I know a lot more that we didn't even get to cover in this. Uh, so perhaps if you're giving this speech again sometime, they can find uh, that information on your calendar on your website. I think you have a list of your- Yes, I normally um, do have my future talks and, um, and I'm actually giving it on the ground in North Carolina next month in February, African American awesome. Black History Month. So yeah, I'll be actually in the Wilson County, North Carolina area um, doing that. Um, it's just, they're a great set of records and I appreciate the opportunity you've given me to talk about records that I think most people um, don't consider for their research and they could be missing out on a whole lot of great information about their family. And nowadays with the indexing and digitization that's occurred, they don't even have to work as hard at it. Yeah, that's, that's awesome because, you know, it just seems like every day thousands and thousands of records are starting to become easier to get to. Easier, uh, but we still got to interpret them accurately and understand their context. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where I think that finding aid, you know, as we were talking before too, it gives you a little history of the Bureau. It, you know, it gives you some oversight about, for example, North Carolina and the Bureau. Or if you look at the one for Delaware, it's going to talk about Delaware and the Bureau. So just good insight that helps you uh, not get too frustrated, hopefully, as you're trying to look through the records. Well, this is certainly another source for our um, turning over every rock or reasonably exhaustive research uh, as we are trying to completely re-piece together uh, the lives of our ancestors. And I really appreciate you coming and, and spending some time. You are a busy lady. It's been hard to get you on, but uh, I appreciate <laughs> you taking the time. No, again, th thank you so much. I, I love these records. And if we can get the word out there, that makes me really happy. Super.
Thank you so much. Well, the Freedmen Bureau records are a deep resource with many levels of records for you to investigate for your ancestors. I hope that was helpful. If so, let us hear from you in the comment sections below. As a reminder, don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so that you get notified each time we upload a video. Also know that Genealogy TV is on Facebook. You can follow us there. Until next time, keep on climbing your family tree.